It's great to be joined once again by former Navy chaplain and current Colorado state representative Gordon Klingenschmidt uh, joining us today from what looks like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a room in the Colorado State House. Is that correct? That's right, David. In all of my previous interviews, I've appeared as Dr. Chaps in my private capacity as a Christian minister. But today you are actually talking to Colorado State Representative Gordon Klingenschmidt, live from the Capitol in Denver, Colorado. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, explain that, because the last interview you were on, you had been elected in this huge, I mean, you had 70% of the vote. It was, it was an amazing victory that you had. Uh, but you said in spite of that, you were speaking as an individual, not as state representative. And, and you made clear that as state rep, you sort of back off of the gay exorcism. You back off of the animals <laughs> infected with the gay demons. Do those views change now because you're joining us in your capacity as state rep? Well, I won't talk generally about my views of the Bible or the things I do as a Christian minister. Yeah. I'm here today to talk about legislation. And if you have official, you know, legislative questions, for example, uh, here in the Colorado State House of Representatives, I was on the committee that heard an issue about transgender access to co-ed bathrooms. I read and about that's a it. Legit legitimate legislative concern. So I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions, but I won't generally quote the Bible when I'm a state representative. But this doesn't change your views about the power of exorcism. You just won't address those necessarily. <laughs> that's right. I generally don't talk about what I do as a Christian minister when I'm in my capacity in the State House of Representatives. So I'm I, I want to talk about this transgender situation. I'm I'm guessing, you know, uh, I don't know why I get the feeling that your view is if your sex is male, you go to the male restroom. If your sex is female, you go to the restroom marked female, period, full stop, no exceptions, right? Yeah, I think that is actually good policy. It has been that way for thousands of years that we've had gender segregated bathrooms in society. Is that uh, true? I mean, thousands of years ago, there were gen. You had that the the little female icon on the bathroom door. Well, I would think whatever the cavemen had, they probably tried to respect each other's privacy. I, I'm not debating whether when the signs were posted on the doors. I mean, I but, would push back. I, I believe that what you're referring to as cavemen, uh, I don't know that I would use that term. Uh, we know a lot about how they lived very communally, you know, both with regard to intercourse, with regard to bathroom habits, etc. I, I think that that may not be the strongest argument for your side. <laughs> Well, we can have these debates, but I'm living in 2016. Oh, so it doesn't actually year, matter what they did thousands of years ago, which you just quoted <laughs> as the reason why we should do it that way today. Well, I've made my point about that. Yes. But stronger argument that I rely upon today is that it hurts the privacy rights of women. It, you know, if you're if you're concerned about women's equality, if you're concerned about women's safety issues, yeah. the last thing you want is a cross-dressing man exposing his private parts to little girls in public bathrooms. Right, but so now Chaplain, uh, I'm sorry, State Representative, I misspoke there, State Representative Klingenschmidt, you know that a cross-dresser has nothing to do with someone whose sexual identity is uh, that uh, of male or of, of man or woman, right? I mean, your uh, cross-dresser seems irrelevant here. Well, if they don't have the surgery, then they are pretending to be the opposite gender and they're calling themselves transgender, but they're lying about their true identity. So in Colorado, we have a law and that is you can't change your birth certificate unless you have three things. Number one is you've got to have the surgery. Number two is you've got to have a court order. And number three is you've got to change your name. And Colorado was one of the first actually to make that liberal allowance that you can get a new birth certificate. But this year, they're trying to ch uh, change the law here in Colorado that you don't have to have the surgery, you don't have to have a court order, you don't have to change your name. All you've got to do is get a note from any doctor in the world that says you're a different gender or that you want to be a different gender. 
So that's crazy. Uh, that's way too liberal. That would open up not just a can of worms, but it would violate the privacy rights of women in their private spaces in places of public accommodation. Talk about public locker rooms, public showers, where now you have men with male parts who don't have the surgery yeah. exposing themselves to little girls in women's bathrooms. Hey, from, a, not from a purely pragmatic standpoint, and I get your position, right? And there are, there are certainly numerous conservatives in this country that share your position. But speaking here as sort of, you know, TV host to state, re state representative, for lack of a better term, um, don't you uh, realize <laughs> that there essentially have been no major issues with this? I mean, Mike Huckabee talked about if the rules had been changed when he was young, he would have used this as an opportunity to be creepy in the girls' locker room. We saw a guy who wanted to sort of test the policy go in and expose his penis, but widely this has not been an issue where, where there are so-called more liberal bathroom laws. Well, the other argument is that if we pass a liberalizing birth certificate bill, for example, yeah. that actually hurts the transgender community. Hmm. And I'm not just concerned about the privacy rights of women and little girls. I'm also personally very compassionate to people who suffer with gender dysphoria. And that is a technical term. It's in the DM, D, uh, DSM-5. It's still a mental disorder. And there are four stages of this mental disorder. It begins with a seed of self-doubt, which progresses to self-hatred, which becomes self-mutilation when they get the surgery, and finally it ends in self-murder. We heard testimony in committee that 53% of transgender people will uh, attempt suicide at some later stage of their development. That's why Johns Hopkins University no longer does the transgender surgery, mm. because it leads to suicide. And by reinforcing this bad idea, and even if the government plants a seed of self-doubt by giving you a new birth certificate, it leads to self-hatred. The person begins to hate their own gender, and then it begins to transforms to self-mutilation where they want to, you know, uh, have a surgery and, and change their anatomy. And finally, it leads to suicide. So the worst thing you can do, if you really want to show compassion for the people who are gender confused, the worst thing you can do is reaffirm their confusion. Chaplain, uh, I'm sorry, State Representative, is this full time? Is the, is the state rep job full time? Like, are you putting 40 hours a week into this stuff? Yes, but only four months a year. So we are in session from January to May, and then we're off for eight months uh, where I go back to my other job as a chaplain. Okay. Question about something that's been in the news recently. You were approached in the state house recently by D.D. Logason, who wanted to ask you questions about your nonprofit and you seem to not want to talk to her and you actually called security to escort her out. What was the story with that? I mean, is that not a topic you want to discuss or was there something specifically about Miss Logason that turned you off in some way that made you have her removed? Well, that's a fair question. Uh, Dee Dee is not a journalist. She's an activist in a political election cycle and she had been stalking me for you know, weeks beforehand. This was not her first trip to the Capitol. Did you she never report requests... the stalking to the police? Um, yeah, in a sense. Uh, you know, obviously you saw the video with the policeman there. No, I but I mean, but hold on a second, Chaplain. I, I, or I'm sorry, State Representative. That's it's a uh, just a sort of comes naturally to be totally <laughs> clear and upfront about what we're saying. You said that at the point at which she approached you that day in question, where we have the video, she had been stalking you. Had the stalking prior, oh, yeah. the alleged yeah. stalking prior to that date, been filed as a report with the police? Um, I don't remember when I first filed, but I gave her a written cease and desist order, okay. which she had already received prior to the day that she came to the Capitol with the cameras. Fair enough. So she was already in violation of that. And now, uh, by the way, I have total transparency on my nonprofit books. I wasn't going to talk to that reporter, so-called activist, but I did talk to a real reporter with the Colorado Springs Gazette, and they ran a front page newspaper story exonerating my nonprofit, that I'm totally transparent, that I never take a dime of salary from my nonprofit, 
that I have a former IRS agent doing my taxes and we passed a third party audit with flying colors. So there's nothing fishy about my nonprofit. In fact, we built an orphanage for 94 children. We care for widows by paying their electric bills and we publish a national television program promoting prayer. So in my duties as a chaplain, we're totally above board and I don't get paid for doing that. Can you just clarify in the video you also referenced that the woman has been stalking you? What has the stalking consisted of? Well, those kinds of things. Um, Showing up you know, at the state house. Oh, yeah. They, they have reporters jump out of the bushes. And even after Miss Logason, uh, you know, was ordered to cease and desist, she continues to harass me. But uh, she sent one of her friends with a different camera. And they literally, it's funny, you're walking back and forth to your office. You're trying to do the people's bus uh, uh, business. And these people jump out of the bushes with instant cameras and they're you know they don't request an interview they just, they just show up and film you when you're trying to do your business that is crazy yeah well it's rude and I don't give those kind of interviews if they want to talk to the scheduler if they want to go through my staff I'd be happy to grant interviews to legitimate news reporters and I've always done that uh, last thing has your legislative work been in any way impacted by the Supreme Court decision over the summer effectively banning state bans on same sex marriage or has that in your legislative capacity not been a thing I know in your capacity as a chaplain it has been sure. a big topic on the pray in Jesus name show with with former Navy chaplain Gordon Klingenschmidt but for state rep Gordon Klingenschmidt is that an issue well, that's a great question. And yes, it is an issue here in Colorado in the State House of Representatives. Three times the people of Colorado have voted against homosexual marriage. But now the Supreme Court has made their decision in Obergefell, and so they've sort of modified the interpretation of the Colorado Constitution. But I'm still, and I've sworn an oath to defend the Colorado Constitution, especially not just on the marriage issue, but on religious freedom. So mm -hmm. I introduced legislation this year to protect clergy and pastors and priests and rabbis and their right to opt out of gay marriage. Unfortunately, the Democrats shot down my good legislation, which passed unanimously in the Texas State House, 142 to zero in Texas. Clergy have the right to opt out of gay marriage, but here in Colorado, they're still vulnerable because the Democrats voted on a party line vote to kill my pro-religious freedom legislation and unfortunately, clergy are vulnerable to lawsuits if they refuse to do gay marriages in Colorado. So I'm but still Chaplain, fighting. Wouldn't it be pro-religious freedom to say, listen, if the Supreme Court has said you can't ban same-sex marriage, as I, as I call it, marriage for anybody at the state level, if someone's religious uh, beliefs uh, are against gay marriage, then they don't have to marry someone of the same sex. But how can you use religion to deny others a right which the constant which, which the Supreme Court has said cannot be denied at the state level? Isn't the religious freedom element to say, hey, you can say your scripture doesn't say, you know, being gay is OK or whatever, but you can't say, oh, because of my arbitrary and particular religious beliefs, I'm going to go against what the Supreme Court has said. That would seem to be wrong to me based on my very rudimentary understanding of how the law works. Well, you're kind of conflating two different issues. One issue is can gay couples get a marriage license in Colorado? And the answer is yes. Right. And, and we're, we're not stopping that. The other issue is should Christians be forced to participate in that gay marriage ceremony, which is inherently a religious ceremony? And I would say no. Christians should not be forced, whether you're a baker or a florist or a photographer, but especially if you're a clergyman, mm. you've got to agree with me, David, that clergymen should not be forced to participate in somebody else's religious ceremony. But even here in Colorado, the Democrats voted to force clergymen to participate or at least make them vulnerable to lawsuits if they refuse. I, I think that's crazy. If you don't believe in any kind of religious freedom, not even for clergy to opt out, then you are a domestic enemy of the Constitution and the people of Colorado ought to vote you out of office. What about other areas where clergy might disagree with what the law is when it comes to what is considered uh, assault or how can you treat uh, people based on their gender, for example? I mean, is, re is so-called religious freedom a sort of get out of jail free card to go against what the prevailing law is on anything you don't like? 
No, that's ridiculous. In fact, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, would ban some kinds of religious freedom if there is a compelling government interest. So in the examples that you cited, if somebody is assaulting a transgender person, that's not protected. There's an inherent government interest in protecting people from assault. But there is no inherent government interest, there's no compelling reason to deprive somebody of their religious views when they're being forced by the government to participate in someone else's religious ceremony. Let the bakers opt out, they're not doing that. Here in Colorado, the baker Jack Phillips has been prosecuted and forced to stop serving any kind of wedding cakes uh, and his, his mother is being sent to re-education training. That's ridiculous. People ought to have the freedom to say no. Uh, you know, let people be in their different camps. Let, live and let live is what I say, but they're not doing that. They're, they want to live and they want to force us to participate, and that violates our freedom. All right. Well, he's made his views clear. It is, of course, State Representative Gordon Klingenschmidt, who happens <laughs> to be a former Navy chaplain and involved with the Pray in Jesus Name project, not greeting me today, uh, uh, saying bless me in the name of Jesus, apparently in his professional role. Uh, State Rep, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you, and I might even whisper, God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you, David. God bless you and your audience. Bye-bye.